last weekend, if you were here, we baptized over 60 people. Isn't that fantastic? It's good for us just to remember the faithfulness of God, the fact that God is doing great things in people's lives, and, and to see people go in the water and come out of the water, and then they walk through this hallway. If you've never seen it, there's a, a group of staff and volunteers as we high-five people that they come down the hallway. On Saturday night when we baptized people last weekend, uh, there was uh, one particular woman, 101 years old, 101. She'd been sprinkled as an infant, and she said, no, I want, to be, I want to be baptized. Her name is Anna. 101 means that she was born about the same year as JFK. It means that she would have been in a teenager during the Depression in her mid-20s. Did you, can you tell I did a little bit of math? Uh, in her mid-20s, she would have been the end of, like, World War II. I mean, this 101 years old, decides to get baptized. We put her in the water, and when she, as soon as she came out of the water, and for the rest of the time, she was just praising God. We thought you might, you got to watch this quick. We thought you might enjoy checking this out. Anna Lewis, watch this. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And she did that all the way out of the water. Uh, they wheeled her through the hallway, all the way down the hallway, and we're just so thrilled and thankful for what God is doing. You know, the, we don't get to decide what church is. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. And then there's instructions in Scripture that tell us what church is. If we hang out together in Starbucks, there's an essence of church there. I mean, you and me, we believe in Jesus, but that's not Church. Church, a couple of the distinguishing characteristics, the fact that we baptize people and the fact that we have communion together. At the end of the service, we're going to share in communion and we're going to worship the Lord in that way and we're looking forward to that. Well, we're wrapping up a series today and in this series, we have learned absolutely nothing. I'm glad you didn't say amen to that. You're like, yeah. We've unlearned a bunch, a bunch of stuff, you know, and so it's, it's who says, you know, your grandma was always right, who says that everyone, uh, everyone's opinion matters or good people go to heaven or you have to go to church. Today we're going to talk about, or, or the, the one we dealt with last weekend, who says that pain should be avoided. This weekend, who says you can't please God? Who says you can't please God? Can you imagine how many people there are on the earth right now who are believing in God, attempting to please him, and yet feeling completely inadequate in the attempt? As I think about believers in Jesus, I wonder how many of the approximate maybe a billion people on the planet who believe in Jesus, I wonder how many... Of them, I wonder how many of you walk around every day with this image of God just smiling over you saying, I'm proud of you. This is the heart of every human being desires this more than anything else. No matter what your earthly father has been like, whether an absent father, an abusive father, or a wonderful father, the heart of every human being longs for a dad to say, I'm proud of you. I'm just proud of you. And I wonder how many, even of us who know Jesus, walk around with this awareness of like, and God loves me. I don't know about you. God's proud of me. I mean, I'm his son, and I'm his, and, and I'm the apple of his eye, and, and I'm special to him. And, and we enjoy one another, and, and, and as much as we want to worship him, that we would actually be honest and say, what, what do I actually think? think of when I think about God. There might be, there might not be anything more important in your life than your perception of God. I wonder what you think about when you think about God. It's incomplete. I mean, you're a finite human being, so it's impossible for you to completely comprehend God. There's a part of God that you comprehend. And there's something that you think about when you think about God. I grew up in a, in a I went to a Catholic school when I was a kid. And um, they hit you there legally. I don't know if you, you know this. But, uh, and I deserved it. I mean, I had nuns that hit me with rulers. 
and, and I, I was hit with all kind of different objects. Uh, this is what we did with kids. I don't, and, and my view of God, I'm not even saying that's wrong. I'm saying, yeah, I deserved it. I mean, I have a son right now who's a lot like me, so I totally get it. Okay, I totally get it. But, but, but my image and view of God was one of either, an, is it an old man with a white beard on the throne? Is it somebody with their arms folded waiting for me to make a mistake? Is it somebody with... Uh, Maybe a baseball bat, God, if I guess, you know, and people will say, well, I did this, and man, God really knocked me upside the head. No, he didn't. He actually never does that. That's not in his character or his nature. Now, he'll correct those he loves, and he'll discipline those he loves, but there was a time where I was riding with my kids, and, and, and Jenna, who is now like 21, was like two or three, maybe four, and I'm ashamed to admit this, but I was driving, and when you're driving, have you ever done something as a parent? You're like, who am I right now? You know, They drive you to the brink of crazy and knock you over, right? And, you just, and I found myself reaching back, you know, as you do. We're crazy as parents. Your parents were crazy, and now you're crazy, too. You have more grace for your parents now. And I found, I flicked my daughter in the head. I flicked her. <laughs> flicked her. Didn't you have that moment of sanity where you're like, I'm an animal. What am I doing? And I had to turn, I had to pull, you know, I had to pull off the side of the road and say, babe, I am so bad as a person and a human being. I flicked you with evil intent. I wanted it to hurt. <laughs> not even going to try to cover it up. I said, which one of the fruits of the Spirit did I not uh, possess there? And she was like, uh, self-control. I was like, yeah, thanks, teacher. <laughs> you know, God has never flicked one of his kids in the back seat. <laughs> Ever. But how do we perceive God? Is he just waiting for you to mess up? He's an in, See, this is the challenge that we have because we are made in his image, but he's not made in our image. You resemble him, but he doesn't have to resemble you. When we create God, we try to create him in our own image, like he's limited like you are. He's infinite. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere at once. In him we live and move and have our being. He sustains the whole earth. Everything that was made was made through him. He's a creator God. He made the universe, and in that moment, in a way, theologically speaking, he had to limit himself because he is beyond the universe. Scientifically, you, you might say, do you believe in the Big Bang theory? Well, I believe that God spoke it, and bang, there it was. And yes, it's ever expanding, but he is outside of it expanding. He's not limited to it. When you pray to God, he's, he's, not, he's not limited to a body on a throne with a beard. He's everywhere at once. He's hearing a billion prayers and, and answering all of them in his own sovereignty. He's so far beyond. He's created everything. We make, like, we make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He makes the known universe. He's so far beyond our ability to comprehend him, it will take us all of eternity, and even then we won't have him completely figured out. An infinite being, an infinite being. So that when we accept Christ, we start to, our eternal life begins, not when we die, but when we accept Christ. And so we start on this journey of knowing him, and this journey will go into eternity. I think in the book of Revelation where we get a picture of heaven, there's those created beings that are circling the throne of God. And there's this beautiful picture in Revelation about God's glory. His glory is uh, his being, his holiness, his perfection, his integrity, his love, his joy. So powerful that it's not contained in a body, but it's all over. It's all over. And the, the created beings are circling the throne and as they come around every time, they say, holy, holy, holy. They have to say it three times. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they circle back around these crazy uh, created beings. They, they, look, they look wild. They have, they have eyes and lion's faces. They look in all directions and six wings. And you're like, what in the world? And every time they fly around, they say, holy, holy, holy. I heard one author say that every time they come around, they say it again because they see another part of God they've never seen before. 
This is what eternity with him will be like. Every day walking with him, being more and more amazed. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we'll see things about him that we've never known. And and we think that we may have, have plunged the depth of his goodness, but we haven't. We haven't seen the end of his love and his grace and his mercy. How good is our God? And so we pray to him and he hears us. But when we think of him, what do we, what do we perceive? See, this is why I'm so thankful that, that, that everyone in our church reads their Bible every day, Project 345. If you're a guest or visitor, um, I'm just proud of every person here because you woke up this morning just like me and you sat down and you read a chapter or two or three. Some of you are overachievers and you read more than that. You're not better than us. Why, why do we read? Not, not for information, but for transformation. Because we're getting to know our God and what he is really like. We're, we're breaking down the lies of the enemy and the perception that we had when we were growing up. You have an absentee father and now you have an absentee God, but he's not absent. You had a distant father, but you don't have a distant God. See, you had an abusive father, but you don't have an abusive God. You had a tyrant as a father, but, but you don't have a tyrant as a God. So you have a loving Heavenly Father. And so all that has to be new and made new in us. When, um, when we went to the moon, they, found some, they, they had some great pictures from the moon of the earth, earth rise. And they've since then taken even more photos. And I wanted you to see this picture of the earth from the moon's perspective. That's, that's, that's one, you know, that's the earth. There's millions of galaxies out there and when we got to the moon and we took this picture I want to assure you that God didn't say wow I'm glad you did that I've never seen it from this perspective before this is really cool I'm pretty big God doesn't wear t-shirts but if he did it would say been there done that (laughs) he's the maker of everything he holds everything together by the work of his power he right now is holding you together he's in all creation Everything that was made was made through Jesus Christ. The Trinity enjoying one another for all of eternity. Infinite, eternal beings that we can't even comprehend. And he's God, and he's above us, and he's outside of us. And how do we perceive what he's like? This is like, I I think of the Greek gods who were arbitrary. I mean, the Greek gods were, some days they were happy, and some days they were sad. And sometimes they would destroy crops, and sometimes they would bless you, and sometimes it's a lightning bolt, and you never kind of knew. And they actually sinned. They weren't perfect. Like, how how would you feel if God was like, well, it's Tuesday. You never know what he's going to be like. Like, if he weren't faithful, we sin, great is your faithfulness, because we know of a faithful God. But what if he wasn't? What is your perception of God? What is he actually like? We see in Scripture where God meets with human beings. There's, in the Old Testament, at least 12 different times where God shows up with human beings on the earth. Of course, we could say in the New Testament, every person who encounters Jesus Christ has encountered God. Because they said, show us the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long and you you haven't seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus Christ, the perfect uh, representative of what the Father is like. If you want to know what the Father is like, look at the life of Jesus. But in the Old Testament, there were people who actually encountered Almighty God. (laughs) This infinite being. You know, of course, in the garden we encountered God. We walked in the cool of the day with him. But then when we sinned, we hid. And our relationship was broken. We had this inability. And every time that God interacts with human beings, there's there's some serious problem. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? uh, It's like a trucker's hat. Uh, uh, It says, uh, Jesus is my homeboy. There's this laissez-faire kind of laid-back feeling about you just have this relationship with Jesus. You just have this relationship with God. He's just my homeboy. Uh, I, I take issue with that because although we're close to God through his son, we don't take him for granted. And when you, you can see, if you studied through the encounters of God with his people, they didn't just, hey, you know, God is my homeboy. It's not like that when they encounter God. Moses was on the backside of the wilderness and and he had killed an Egyptian, and he thought, you know, his uh, days of leading uh, were over. And it wasn't unusual in the Judean wilderness that in the arid climate uh, that there would be combustible uh, shrubs. What was unusual about this combustible shrub that was on fire, of course, was that there was a voice coming from it, and it wasn't consumed by the fire. 
immediately we know that this wasn't God in totality. God is not a burning bush. God is dumbing it down for us. He's coming with some of his glory because you can't handle all of him at once. You say, Lord, show us your glory. You don't want that. You, you don't want that. You need a mediator to help you. And so he came, and, and he was kind, and he was generous, and, and he was patient. And, he, and, he, and, he, and as soon as Moses sees this burning bush and it's not consumed, uh, he, he goes to it. And immediately there is the voice that says, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. In other words, you can't approach me completely. You can't, there's a problem in this relationship immediately. I'm not even showing you all of my glory, and yet even still you have to take your sandals off because you can't approach this. This is, this is holiness. This is something you as a human being don't know really anything about. He says, you're going to go deliver my people, and then Moses, in typical human fashion, sent by God should be enough. Like, I, I just talked to a burning bush, said, come and do this. I'm just going to do it because, man, if you can talk through a burning bush, you're probably bigger and better than me. But instead, who should I say sent me? <laughs> and he gets the answer. I am. Dude, that's smack down. I mean, that's that I am sent you. I don't even need a name. I always was. I always will be. I am right now. And if I tell you to go, I'm going to back it up. Just go. I am. This is the same thing that Jesus said to the Pharisees. They said, well, we're, our father is Abraham, and your father's the devil. And he said, man, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And before Abraham was, I am. Jesus adopting the same language because he is God. So Moses goes, and he does what he's told, and then he starts to develop a relationship with God, and he starts to learn who God is. And as he learns who God is, he learns that he can have a conversation with God, even negotiate. With the creator God. Aren't you thankful that as you develop a relationship with Jesus, you begin to learn who God really is? And all the myths and all the ideas that are out there start to fall away. You can know who God really is through his son Jesus. You can know who he is. Not in totality, but he reveals himself to us. So eventually Moses gets to the place where God says, I'm going to send you out and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you to go here and here's what we're going to do. And Moses literally says to him, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. Well, the first time he met the father, it was like, who should I say sent me? And now he's saying, I know you're sending me, but if you don't go with me, we don't have a chance. So I want you to go with us. And then uh, this is at the time when, when uh, God is giving him the Ten Commandments. And even then he has to surround the mountain with a cloud, a dark cloud. And he says, don't even let the people come up unless I break out against them and they die. Is it because he's a tyrant and he's angry and he's mad? No, it's because he's holy and perfect and can't be approached by sinful human beings. Here again, he's protecting them from himself, protecting us. Then, See, we need a mediator to help us relate to God. Then uh, in Exodus 33, Moses was bold enough and Moses said, now show me your glory. I, I want to see you. I've seen parts and bits and pieces. There was, there was times where Moses would be on the mountain with God and his face would just shine. He would come down from being with God and his face was glowing, freaking everybody out. They literally had to put napkins over his face. Like, you're freaking us out. I mean, it's kind of handy to have in the tent at night because we can see what's going on, but <laughs> this is before cell phones, you know. Moses, come over here. Show me your glory, Lord. I want to see you in all of your fullness. In Exodus 33, 19, the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness. I want you to see these words that God uses. He could have said, I'm going to let you see all of my power. He didn't say that. He said, goodness. I'm going to let all of my goodness pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have, then immediately we see this trouble with the relationship. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Why is he talking about this? I will have compassion on who, whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place uh, near me where they're having this conversation, where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, 
I'll put you in the cleft of a rock, in between these rocks. You hide in there and, and cover you. I'll cover you with my hand until I have passed by. This is, again, God being gracious. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. <laughs> this is fantastic. This tells us a lot about God. He's gracious and kind. He knows we can't handle. I mean, if, if I said, well, uh, you invited me over to your house for a meal, and I said, I'll come over, but I'm going to have to back in. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't handle all of this. You would immediately say, our pastor has a pride problem. We need to go to another church immediately. God, so infinite and glorious and powerful and holy that he has to hide man in the cleft of a rock and put his hand over him and then pass by, you know. Because you can't see the front of him. How awesome is this God? And how could this God ever be pleased by human beings? How could we ever approach him or think that we could please him? He doesn't need us, but we infinitely need him. He doesn't need his creation, yet he created us. And we desperately need him. But he doesn't need us, yet he wants us and desires us. He loves us. But he doesn't have to, to be fulfilled. He doesn't need anything to be fulfilled. He doesn't need us, yet he loves us. And we in our soul require God in order to be satisfied. And so many times don't seek him. Exodus 34, it goes on. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord. Look at, the, look at the descriptor again. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Do you see a theme here? He's telling who he is, and then immediately he's talking about us and the problem that we have in relating with him. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Because this is the response of human beings in the presence of a holy God. Every single time that a human being encounters God, they fall down, basically. They, they fall down and worship. They fall down. There was a, a, a time in my life where I was arrogant enough to say, Well, I've got a few questions I'm going to ask him when I get there. I mean, arrogant enough to think, number one, that you're ever going to stand in his presence. And then he's going to be held on trial by you. God is powerful enough right now that he could wipe me from the face of the earth. He hears everything that I'm saying right now. And he could wipe me from the face of the earth. And it wouldn't be work for him. Now, thank God he's gracious and kind, and he loves me. There's been some things I've said in the past where I move over for the lightning bolt to strike, you know. He's not that way. He's not that way. The disciples said, shouldn't we call down fire on these people? And he said, Jesus said, you don't know the spirit that you're even of. God doesn't want to destroy and fry people. He's going to die for people so they can know him. You don't know what he's really, really like. He's not like any human being you've ever met in your life. There's another time where Jesus is transfigured, which, which simply means he was glorified before he was resurrected. His glorified body where he was walking through walls and doing all these things with the disciples before he ascended into heaven after he'd been resurrected. This glorified body was seen on a hillside with a few of the disciples. While he was there, Elijah shows up and Moses shows up. I mean, I mean and, and he's glowing white, I mean super white, and they just fall on their face. The disciples do, the three disciples. And, of course, the apostle Peter can't help himself. He starts talking like, man, we should build three tabernacles. This is going to be awesome. Can you imagine how, how many CDs we're going to sell? I mean, this is going to be great. And, and as he's talking, Matthew 17, while he's still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice in the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This isn't the only occasion this happened. When Jesus was baptized, he went down in the water, and when he came up, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, lights upon him. And a voice comes from heaven. If you ever wonder about the Trinity, it's right there in that verse. 
and a voice from heaven. The, the sun is coming out of the water, the spirit lighting on him, and then a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You want to be pleasing to the father? Get to know the son. Jesus prayed that we would be one in the same love that he actually prayed in John 17. The same love that I have here between the Father and the same love that we have that you would know that he loves me and he loves you. Do you know when you know Christ, the Father loves you just like he loves the Son? Can you believe that? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called the sons and daughters of God. Every moment that you live, as you're living for Christ, he's looking down upon you and he's seeing his son. And at any moment, you could rightfully say from Scripture, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He loves me. He's proud of me. He's with me. I'm his daughter. I'm his son. You may have had who knows what for an earthly father, but you have a heavenly father that loves you. Loves you. Loves you. So there's a few things. Now, as, as we live for Christ, uh, there are things that we do that actually please God. Some people say, well, you could never pray enough. You could never do enough. That's not true. You're pleased with your children. And it's not based on what they do. Amen? I was watching my son this morning from, uh, uh, second, uh, from my uh, office. I could see out the window, and he was downstairs early in the morning playing basketball, shooting hoops. And I was standing there watching him. I was loving it, man. He's getting some skills, dribbling, man, shooting. And I, I could see that he saw me. And when he saw me, man, he put on a show. He was doing all the stuff, man. He was, you know, boom. I mean, it was awesome. And he's going up and taking shots, and then he's just sneaking a peek, seeing if I'm watching him. Eventually, he looked full on at me. And what do I do as an earthly father? Man, I wave and thumbs up and, oh, proud. If I, being human, know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? He loves us infinitely more than we love our own children. We should walk with joy in him. We should enjoy our relationship with him. And when you sin, you should just run to him. You just run to him and you repent and you say, Father, I'm sorry. I know you're not surprised at this, but I just want to I want to be right with you above everything else. And he is well pleased in that. To please God. To please God, you must first fear God. To fear God isn't to say, I fear a tyrant. It's to say, I have incredible awe and respect for who he is and who I'm not. He's bigger than me. He could wipe me out, but thank God he's not going to. He's not going to. But at the same time, there's a, there's a respect there and actually a trembling fear of him. And if you have a trembling fear of him, it will, it will guide you in wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And to drive your life away from sin... It's your fear of God, and a healthy fear of God is good for every believer and required in Scripture. You'd think, how awesome is this God? Like, I want to be on the good side of him. I want to please him. I want to live a life that's pleasing to him. Psalm 147, 11 says, but the Lord takes pleasure. He takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. As you read his word, as you give, You're you're honoring him, and he loves that. He's well pleased with that. Well pleased with that when we fear him. Our faith pleases God. Just simply being here today and trusting in him, not worrying and not fretting, but saying, Lord, I I trust in you with all of my life. He's well pleased in that. It says in in Hebrews, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He's well pleased with your faith today in him. When we fear him, when we have faith in him, our purity pleases God. We didn't used to live pure. We lived however we wanted. We didn't care. But now we're driven towards purity. Sin bothers us. And as you're living for him by the power of the Holy Spirit in purity, it pleases God. I mean, how many people on the earth just don't even care about God? But you do. And your purity, walking before him in purity, pleases him. When people come to the office to get married, some folks, uh, we do free office weddings, many of you know. And, and so some people have been shacking up for a long time. 
Can I say that? Because I just did. <laughs> You're like, oh, we're in church. Yeah, and people still shack up. So, but they want to honor God. And so they come into the office. There is a tangible presence of God's favor every single time. Why? Well, purity pleases God. Sin doesn't surprise him, but purity pleases him. Romans 8, 6 through 8 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're fighting against that sin. And you're walking in purity. And it, it just pleases him that we do that. Our obedience pleases God. I don't always obey on the first time. I don't know if you're like that. The joy of your life is dependent upon the obedience in your heart. And when you obey, you're content and you're satisfied, you're filled with joy, and he is pleased. Nothing more that we want to hear in the world than our Father say, well done, good and faithful servant. Actually, obedience is your modus operandi. That's, what, that's where you function best, in holiness, in purity, in obedience, in the fear of God, in all these things. This is your life blood. This is what you love more than anything else. We didn't always love it, but now we do. Why? Because pleasing God pleases us. When we worship, when we serve, I walk through the healing center and I think, no wonder God's hand is on this church. When you love people in his name, he is well pleased with that. When you give, he is well pleased with that. It's not about the money, it's about the worship. When you sing, you come here and you sing, some of you can't sing at all. But we don't know because everybody's singing together. And we're not singing for each other, we're singing for an audience of one. And man, is he pleased in that. He's pleased looking over his body. And the only way we can be pleasing to him is through his son, Jesus. And so it's fitting today that we would receive communion. So if you would uh, take the communion elements there. If you didn't receive the elements, the ushers are going to come and make sure that you do. Just slip your hand up and make sure that you get one of these. I would encourage you to start opening it now. It can be a challenge. Hey, communion isn't a time where we say, since we're all so perfect, we can now receive communion. Communion is a time where we confess that we need the body and blood of Jesus. You're all pretty concentrated on opening that, so I'm going to wait. <laughs> Make sure we've served everybody. If you, if you haven't been served, would you raise your hand there? There's a couple here. Thank you. The night when Jesus was going to be betrayed, he looked forward to being with his disciples, and he did something that he'd never uh, done before. He's about to die on the cross for them. And he takes the bread, and, and, he, and he says, this is, this is my body, and, it, and it's broken for you. And, he's, and he wants us to do this in remembrance of, of him because he wants us to admit, confess to him, to, to one another. I need the broken body of Jesus Christ in order to have a relationship with the Father. And I'm so thankful for his broken body. So we confess this need together. We remember his death for us. Would you break this and receive it with me? On the same night, he, he took the wine and he said, uh, there's a new covenant that I'm initiating. For the remission of sins, the spilling of my blood, it's the only way your sins can be covered. And if you need this relationship with Jesus through his shed blood, would you receive this with me? Now as we worship the Lord and, and think of his death for us, would you stand and we're going to sing together.
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down.
before uh, we close in prayer. I uh, wanted to let you know there, you know, there are thousands of us who've been in this Who Says series going through a small group curriculum. And we thought that as we come to the end of this series, you may want to continue with your group. And so we provided uh, The Spirit Within, which is a series that we did last year. And so we put some curriculum together so that your small group can continue. If you're with some people in your group that you really love and want to continue, then you can grab this material on your way out. If you don't really like the group that you've been a part of, start a new group. There's some other people. Don't tell them I said that. I'm just saying... Uh, or maybe you missed being in a group and it's not too late, you can start one. Really want you to be able to be together. And, uh, you know, in one another, in our relationship with Jesus, we see God in different ways. And the picture is more complete as we're together in his body. So uh, take advantage of that. Also, there's, there's prayer down front uh, if you'd like to receive prayer before you go. Would you bow your head with me? And we'll pray. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your promise to us that Whenever we gather in your name, you're with us. Lord, the greatest joy of being together in church is that you're with us. Every single time you're speaking to us, you're showing us things, we love your presence, Lord. We love to obey you. We love to walk according to your word. Oh, we love your word. We lift up our hands to your word. We love you, Father. We thank you for what you're doing among us. God, thank you for the testimony of Anna who's baptized at over 100 years old. May we be that willing and obedient throughout our entire life to you. Now I pray for your people today, God. I pray a blessing over them. Lord, that they would walk in your freedom, your mercy, and your grace. And God, I do ask you that as they walk filled with your Holy Spirit, that there would be a brand new awareness of your pleasure, the pleasure that you take in your sons and daughters. We thank you, Father. Go with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.